to action. Um, I work um, currently on the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust projects on breeding curlews, funnily enough, in the hay meadows of the Severn and Avon in Gloucestershire and Worcestershire. Um, I've been looking at them there for the best part of 20, 20 years, and they're in uh, flood meadows alongside the rivers. So um, I have seen some curlews in meadows and have some understanding of, uh, of why the uh, meadows are important to, to curlews, but uh, of course they nest in other sites as well. Um, and I should say that um, Mary Colwell and I um, and another colleague visited the Netherlands last, last week where they have a huge um, research uh, program, a whole lot of programs on what they call meadow birds, which are birds that nest in meadows, fairly obviously, but particularly waders. So they're very interested in godwits, lapwings, snipe and rough, and also curlews. And they have a big program and lots of discussion about meadow birds. And I suspect that some of the considerations that came up in the Netherlands, where agriculture is incredibly intensive, uh, may come in tonight. Uh, so enough from me. We have three speakers this evening. Um, uh, first is Elizabeth Cook from Plant Life, who's going to talk about meadows in general and the botanical background. Then Mike Pollard, who, like me, works on curlews, but in the Upper Thames uh, Valley, uh, where most of uh, the nesting curlews um, are in riverside meadows. And finally, Lizzie Gration from the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, uh, who works on meadows in Hampshire, where there are um, many nesting water birds, more lapwings and, cur uh, and red shank than curlew, but she has been for a long time work, uh, working on this and has just finished a PhD on the subject. Um, so we're hoping that um, uh, w w we're planning to give from each one of the speakers a short introductory presentation uh, on their specialist aspect of it, but we do very much want to leave room for some discussion uh, and question and answer session afterwards. So without more ado, ado I'll invite Elizabeth uh, Cook from Plant Life to start, uh, to start, set the ball rolling. Thanks, Elizabeth. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, so I trust you can all see my, um, my slides. Um, so yeah, I'm a botanical uh, specialist at Plant Life, and um, Plant Life we're a, a plant conservation charity. Um, we work across across the UK and and globally, and we're interested in plant conservation, as the name suggests. So um, first up to set the scene as to meadow, um, we're talking here about species rich native meadows, not what often in the sort of particularly in the media gets called a, a meadow, um, which on, on the right hand side, which is often more like cornfield annuals. But um, with, here we've got cornflower and corn marigolds. Um, and so that's not what we traditionally mean by a, a meadow. So a, a meadow in its in its um, traditional sense um, is is made up um, a lot determined by its its management. So that's a a, a, a mowing and grazing regime that I'll, I'll come to next. Um, but a meadow is also it's very complex and made up of many different aspects. You've got the the, the vegetation structure, all the rest of the wildlife and the wildflowers that that you get. In, in a meadow, um, but it's also determined by the, the soil fertility levels, the soil type um, and the water levels, depending on what type of species you'll get in this meadow. And um, I'll just have to stick this in yet. In, it's also you often get curlews um, in meadows, though this one is actually pictured in what looks more like a pasture, but um, we'll pass on that. Um, so meadow management. Um, is the sort of the traditional cycle of of meadow management goes from um the the start of the year you would um well the, the start of the year in sort of april um you would shut up the meadow as it as it's called and stop any grazing in in the land and the, this sort of shut up date varies different parts of the country on different grasslands but roughly sort of end of April, April, beginning of May sometimes. Um, 
And so then throughout May, June, you'd not have any grazing at all. You let the grass grow up, the flowers flower. Um, and then come uh, June, July, August, you then cut it and take a hay crop. And so uh, a hay would be where you, um, you cut the grass and then you leave it on the field for a couple of days and you turn it to help it dry, dry out and you let it wilt in the field till it's sort of reasonably dry. Whereas if you were making silage, um, you would you'd sort of bale it much more quickly and haylage, you'd be only you'd be leaving it for maybe a day or two. Um, then after you've taken your, your hay crop, then um, you would put livestock in and they would then graze what's called the aftermath grazing, that the aftermath that grows up after you've taken your hay cut um, through the autumn and potentially into the winter, depending on if conditions allow. And so meadows with this sort of this management regime, you can get them on different soil types. But generally, meadows are found on neutral soils here on the top right. Um, and this is where this is talking about the pH of the soil on more sort of acid or calcareous soils. It generally tends to be slightly more pasture. And that's that sort of grazing throughout the year or basically not taking a hay cut. But you also get meadows forming, as Mike was um, just referencing, in the sort of more floodplain areas. So these can the soils can be quite neutral, but they they can be very wet, um, or seasonally wet. And depending on when the wet and how wet, it depends on what species you get. Um, and an, another grassland type to mention that often gets um, overlooked is a wax cap grassland, and these tend to be pasture management. Um, but they have a diverse range of um, soil fungi um, and there's some very excitingly coloured ones. So I encourage you to check out old pastures in the autumn <clears throat> for their, um, their grassland fungi. So um, meadows, they're fabulous for the species, but they're also really great for the ecosystem services that they provide. Um, and we're coming to realise more and more the benefits that species rich grasslands bring. Um, so this can be on flood alleviation, soaking in more groundwater, also the carbon storage. Grasslands often get short shrift in compared to woodlands, but um, the data is, is still coming along and there's a lot of questions to answer still. But um, very much think that there is a lot of carbon stored in grasslands in the soil, whereas in, in woodlands, it's all in the sort of above ground biomass. Um, in the soil, many of these deep rooting species, particularly in the sort of floodplain um, scenario, they very deep rooted and they sort of leach uh, carbon into the soil. Um, and so particularly at depth, you get a lot of carbon stored in grasslands compared to other habitat types. And there's also the, the aesthetic value um, the meadows bring and um, just the general joy and richness they add to our, our landscapes. However, um, these meadows are um, in short supply, short supply nowadays. Um, there are very few left. The sort of the figure that's oft touted is the 97% um, loss in um, species rich grasslands. Um, and now most grasslands look like the picture on the right with um, very few species. If you were to sort of look at one metre squared um, of, of this area, you'd be find 10 or fewer species, probably around sort of five if you're lucky. Um, and ryegrass tends to be the dominant species here. And although some sometimes curlew can survive in these habitats, there's going to be, I would presume, far less for them to eat um, than there is in a more diverse grassland. So this um, that figure of 97% decline comes from a paper that was published in 1987. Uh, by a chap called Fuller, and he looked at different grassland types and how they've declined over time. Um, anyway, as you can see that the improved grasslands go up. Oh, you can't see my mouse, can you? That doesn't work. But anyway, the improved grasslands go up, whereas species rich grasslands um, go very much go down. And um, and we see the same sort of figures in, in curlew numbers. This is data from the BTO. Um, curlew numbers just tracking that sort of, there's a correlation there you can argue as to causation, but I think it's certainly a, a contributing factor. And so now we're left with 
of the of the UK land area. Um, data from UK CEH um, shows that there's about 40% of our land area in the UK is grassland. Um, and that's a combination of both improved grassland, so that's sort of the stuff on the top right, um, and more semi-natural grassland, so that would either be bottom right or on the left. Um, and of this 40%, 11% of it is classed as being semi-natural. And, and the, again, the data is somewhat lacking, but we think about 1% to 3% um, is species-rich grassland, and that's covering um, both calcareous and acid and neutral grassland. So it's not just meadows, it's also the sort of Salisbury Plain. Um, so the, the reasons for these uh, declines go back quite a, a long, quite a long time. We used to have uh, a lot more call for pay. It, we had a lot more horses. They used to eat a lot of hay. We didn't have cars, we had horses. Um, so we had to feed them um, and all the livestock um, that used to just eat hay, whereas now there's been a shift to silage. Um, and, and another thing to note about this sort of this picture here and the people cutting and or turning the hay in this case, um, was that it was a slow process doing these hay cuts. You needed a lot of people and it took a lot of time. And so you would gradually move around the fields and you would do them all at different times. You don't just go out on the 15th of July and when the you, countryside stewardship agreement says you can start cutting and everybody's starting cutting on that date. You would have sort of moved around and cut different meadows at different times in different years. Um, and you'd have got to some much earlier and some much later. So that added more, that diversity in cutting day gives you more diversity in, in plants because some plants prefer an earlier cut and some are later. Um, and also it would allow more room for the curlews to coexist. But then uh, comes sort of green revolution and then the, the, the world wars where we had a lot of um, grasslands were ploughed up and converted to arable farming. Um, and then, then there's been a lot of uh, agricultural improvement in these, these grasslands. We've seen more silage production going on. Um, and the sort of it can be sort of 33 days and then they're taking another silage cut. And it really doesn't leave you much room for ground nesting birds. And it certainly doesn't allow much in the way for uh, plant species diversity. So now a lot of grasslands are just sown with uh, ryegrass and white clover. And so the sort of bright green fields that you see across across a landscapes are made up of very few species. So plant life have been trying to um, reverse these declines and uh, restore grasslands. Um, and we've been doing a lot of different projects on this. And since 2013, we've helped to restore over 4000 hectares of, of meadow. And we've had a lot of different projects that have, have worked on this. We started with the Coronation Meadows project back in 2013. And then since then, there's been um, various other Save Our Magnificent Meadows projects. And then currently, um, we've got projects going on with English Heritage, creating uh, meadows in honour of the, the King's coronation. And, and also with National Highways, um, we're working with them to create more meadows. And then we're working with a, a diverse range of partners um, both on sort of meadow creation, but also on the advocacy front. So we're doing a project at the moment with WWF calling for a grassland action plan um, and a lot of, well, more uh, lobbying the, the government on that. So um, I will bring that to a close and um, thank you very much. And if you want um, places to go for look for advice on either managing um, meadows from a sort of uh, in a garden context or in a farmland context, God, um, you can go to the Plant Life Meadows Hub and we've got a lot of advice there. Or the Farm Wildlife website's got a lot of advice about general farmland management for um, nature friendly farming practices. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed, Elizabeth. That's a brilliant uh introduction to the to the whole process and i'm sure we'll we'll look more carefully at your plant life website my my only comment is i really dislike the term improved grassland i think i think i think it should be banned from the vocabulary you can say agriculturally improved if you like but it should be altered or changed but i to 
to, to, to always to say improve grassland rather sort of uh, shoot, shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> I, I think, that, sorry, that's been a bugbear of mine. And it happens in, in all European languages do it. They, in German, they say melioration for, uh, and for, for improve, so-called improving. And what it means is transforming <laughs> still. There we go. Sorry, sorry about that. But um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure our participants will, uh, will see the point. Right, let's go straight on to Mike, shall we? I'm, if, if anybody's got any questions, please put, um, put, put them up in the chat. Um, and we'll uh, we'll come to them later. Uh, Mike, over to you. Thanks, uh, Mike. Thanks for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Mike Pollard. I'm here uh, representing the Upper Thames. I'm the chair of the Upper Thames Wader Group, and I lead the Curly Recovery Project across the Upper Thames, which is hosted by Wild Oxfordshire. Um, and I'm also the conservation officer for the Banbury Ornithological Society, which is my main study area. Um, and for many years, I worked for the RSPB as an area reserves manager, sort of covering the Midlands. So uh, in recent years, I've got a lot of experience uh, with curlews. Um, the Upper Thames really is a vital landscape for curlews in lowland England. As you can see on the map there, it's a real sort of little fo focus area, an important area connecting other populations together, sort of north and south, east and west. We've got around 50 pairs in our meadows and, and some other grass and habitats. That's about 10% of the lowland curlews that we've got. And we know what, what dire straits curlews are in. We've lost half of them in 25 years and we, we're globally important for curlews. So yeah, Upper Thames, great area for curlews. Um, this is the area that we work in. Um, some well-known places there like Otmore, um, but we, we cover right from the south there, the Ock catchment, um, right up to South Warwickshire further north. And we've got a real group of partners that we're working together, including Natural England, RSPB, Wildlife Trust, River Tame Conservation Trust and Freshwater Habitats Trust. And we've got a big team of volunteers and a, a whole host of farmers and other people all working together um, to do what we can for curlews and of course the very special habitats that they live in. Um, the River Thames has some of the finest examples of uh, floodplain meadows in the country. It's internationally important. Um, this site, Pixie Mead, is not far from Oxford. It's recently become a wildlife trust reserve. Um, curlews live there. Um, it's got over 200 species of plants. It's just an amazing place and you can just see how it fits into the landscape there. Um, and they've got an important role helping to protect places like Oxford, of course, from floods, as well as providing great wildlife habitat, um, very rich places. Um, and we've got a quite, a, quite a network of these floodplain uh, meadows and floodplain grazing marshes uh, around the, the Thames and the various tributaries. Um, we've got a few other types of meadows dotted around as well. Some of them sit a bit wetter than the pixie mead. This is on the left is a, is a meadow along the Charwell, which is dominated by the narrow leaved water dropwort, which why it's designated as a triple SI, amazing site with, with a pair of curlews often there. And on the right, we also have the more um, enhanced grassland, <laughs> agriculturally enhanced grassland. Um, uh, example in Warwickshire there, which still has some botanical diversity, but clearly less uh, rich botanically and less rich for in terms of inverts. Um, I'll just talk a little bit now about why meadows are so important for curlews. They are really great habitats for them. And this really, particularly the ancient hay meadows, they're really rich in botanical diversity, as we've heard, and they're very rich in uh, wider, particularly invertebrate diversity and abundance as well. There's key factors. So they're great places to study. And in the season, they provide a huge abundance of food. So in terms of how curlews feed in meadows, when the curlews return in sort of late February, early March, the meadows are often quite wet um, and they're a great place for the adult curlews to feed, to probe into these wet, into those soils, uh, finding the earthworms and other invertebrates. Um, and then through the season, as the meadows develop, um, of course, the soils dry out. Um, 
becomes less good for probing, but by the time the grass has grown up, there's, there's now an abundance of invertebrates. So by the time the curlew chicks hatch out, which of course is about now, um, there is this abundance of food. So the chicks are really precocious. You know, they as soon as they hatch out of the egg, they start feeding themselves. The adults just keep a watch on them, chase away the predators, hopefully. Um, keep them out of harm's way as best they can. And the chicks just find these meadows, particularly the botanically rich ones, really good for feeding. They grow very quickly. And of course, the meadows are a great place for the curlews to nest in. Um, late April, early May is the main nesting period, just when the meadows are starting to grow, of course. So the nest rapidly becomes concealed in the growing grass and the birds could be really well hidden. Um, for their sort of month-long incubation, and of course the wonderful experience of the of, of the chicks hatching out um, and having a, you know what is a great habitat, it, it particularly as I say in these ancient meadows. So the chicks um, have got great places to be reared. Um, the adults looking after them. The top right shows um, one of our nest sites. Can you just see the electric fence around it? This photo was taken literally just as the chicks were hatching. So remember this field when the eggs were laid was extremely flat, relatively very low grass growth, you know, just starting to come through. Just see how quickly that grows in a month. Um, and, and this then provides a great place, as I mentioned, for the chicks to feed. The adults keeping a very watchful eye over the chicks. Um, but also it's creating a very relatively safe place for the chicks because this meadow is not going to be cut till the middle of July um, and it's also safe both from the cutters but also from potentially from predators like foxes and the avian predators because the chicks can hide much more easily um, and of course as we know foxes and badgers particularly foxes are important predators of curly chicks and, and nests um, as well as our avian predators but these floodplain meadows are but they do have a risk of flooding spring floods do occur and we do lose nests in some years to spring floods that of course may become more regular in the future so that's one of the threats we've got um another threat we're well aware of, of course is um the cutting of hay earlier on in the season for particularly for haylage or silage um this this is happening at the moment and of course when the chicks are young um they often just lie flat in the grass uh and that's not good news. As the chicks get older, they can run away um, and quite often can escape. Sometimes the farmers um, can find the chicks as well or us as volunteers. But it's a difficult time for for the adult curlews to keep the chicks clear of trouble and a very stressful time for us as volunteers trying to help do what we can to, for, to, to help the chicks survive and, and uh, working with the farmers. I should also say the cut hay is also a great place for the chicks to feed. The adults seem to like feeding in there. I think Amanda Perkins mentioned this at the last seminar. It's something, um, it's, it's a bit of a risk really, because by being, so I'll just go back to the previous slide, the chicks are lured out into these these feeding areas, but they're, they're so vulnerable there to avian and, and fox predation. So um, yeah, it's a complex picture. Um, but there's a lot of threats, of course, to curlews, particularly in places like Oxfordshire, where there's a lot of pressure on land for all other, other sort of uses. Tree planting, we've got cricket bat willows being planted on some meadows. We've got developments, you know, creeping out from uh, quite a pace from some of the towns and villages. Um, and we've got quite, you know, increasing numbers of livestock in grazing in some areas. And it's quite a balance between, you know, an ag uh, a pastoral system with with hay cuts that are relatively benign for curlews moving into a more intensive livestock um, you know farming setup where you really has little space for hay meadows or is dominated by you know early hay cuts or silage production um, but we have found that we can create great meadow habitat for curlews in the upper thames uh, I've got a couple of examples. So what we're aiming to do is create the species rich grass and we'll restore it if we can, but in many cases we do need to re recreate it almost from scratch. And um, for curlews, we're really looking for large, fairly flat fields. We're looking for our open landscapes. We're looking to manage them through a, a sort of low density grazing mosaic. Um, we, we really want landscapes that, as we know, are lower in, in the generous predators and sort of subtle variation in topography is really helpful to create that variety of 
um, of, of sort of plant life, but also sort of good feeding areas, particularly for the chicks. Um, and this habitat sort of uh, restoration and creation has been funded since the 1990s, originally by the Upper Thames Tributaries Environmentally Sensitive Area, which was really, really important in terms of um, stemming the loss of this habitat in, in the Upper Thames. And then more recently through the countryside stewardship, uh, the higher tier in particular, continuing to fund these schemes and bringing more on stream. Um, but as ever, it, it's very vulnerable to funding cuts and changes in staff and so on. This is a really nice example that a project that um, Anne Cotton from Natural England worked with the farmer here along the Thames. Uh, an arable field that flooded regularly has been restored to a wet grassland, a wet, me oh, sorry, wet meadow um, with pools. And after, it took a while, but after about 15 years, the curlews started colonising this from uh, other sites nearby. And the last couple of years they've started nesting and this year for the first time they've actually hatched chicks. So it's been a fantastic result um, for, for everybody involved really. Um, those are the actual chicks that hatched out about a week or so ago. So that's a brilliant result. And then over at Otmore, where the RSPB has recently established quite a, quite a large reserve, um, the curlies are also doing better. Um, and the Otmore Basin is, a, is, is a, one of the tributaries of the Thames, the River Ray flows through the Otmore Basin. It's a natural saucer um, and it extends for about a thousand hectares. Uh, a lot of it was drained for arable uh, farming in the 70s and 80s. Um, but a, a site of special scientific interest survived with some really nice hay meadow habitat. And since then, um, through the 90s and more recently, through the work of local farmers, uh, the MOD, the RSPB, Wildlife Trust and others, that habitat has expanded massively. So we've now got this big expanse of both lowland hay meadows and the floodplain grazing marsh. And the curlews have responded there. We had 21 pairs of curlews or not more last year, which is the highest number ever recorded. So it shows that where we can invest money on into habitat restoration for curlews and get everything right, really, they can do really well, of course. So in terms of future prospects, what we need, we need, need big areas well managed for curlews and of course, all the other benefits that Elizabeth mentioned as well. Um, they're, they're massive. The Wildlife Trust are doing a similar project at Chimney Meadows, and they're also now expanding this working with farmers. There's a farmer cluster established. This is just upriver of Oxford, a, an amazing triple SI hay meadow, lots of land restored for as hay meadows by the Wildlife Trust, and more land coming on stream, so that's great. We've also got almost all of our areas now have farmer clusters established where farmers are working with conservation and staff and volunteers. So that is going to be the sort of key for success in our patch, everybody working together, but particularly farmers and volunteers and conservation and urgently needing funding. So a couple more slides. What's really needed now, as I mentioned, we need more investment in the areas where we've still got curlews. We need we need more meadows. We need to target the new countryside stewardship plus and the landscape recovery into these areas. We do need to see more meadow restoration and, and more improved management of those meadows for curlews and all the other wildlife. To do this, we need a lot more advisors on the ground. We've lost that capacity and we do have some still, but it's really key to success, that long term um, partnership between the conservationists and farmers. And we need this ongoing predator management. And as we know, we need to do more on that front. Um, that's just about it from me. Um, just to add, if you want to read more about the curlews in the Banbury area, have a look on the Banbury Ornithological Society website. Um, if you'd like to be a, join the Upper Thames Wader group, the, the email address is there at the top. You can contact me as well on email and Twitter. Um, but just finally to thank Wild Oxfordshire for hosting the Curly Recovery Project and to thank all the partners and farmers and volunteers involved in the project because, uh, you know, together we are making quite a big difference. OK, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike, for that very uh, extensive uh, survey of all the things going on. And if uh, I really would encourage anybody participating in this webinar to put in any thoughts and questions into the chat 
Um, it, our two speakers so far have raised an awful lot of questions. I'd particularly uh, look at, uh, suggest you might want to ask questions about uh, cutting dates, which um, uh, Elizabeth showed what the uh, how they originally used to work, but of course, um, with increasing intensification of agriculture, cutting dates go forward. We saw in the Netherlands last week just how intensive it can get. We saw fields with curlew trying to nest on them that got cut four times a year for silage four every 33 days, and it needed a whole network of volunteers to go out and try and protect the curlews uh, from uh, the effects of this very intensive uh, agriculture. And I know that Mike and his colleagues in um, in the Upper Thames area have, have done a great job at, at, at getting volunteers together. It, it's crucially important to have lots of eyes and ears out there helping and you, you, you need to monitor what's going on and groups of volunteers are, are a really important thing. But what the most important thing of all is just how important farmers, farmers and farming practices are in the whole thing. Most of the farmers, in my experience, and from what Mike has just said, sounds like the same is true in the Upper Thames, are only too pleased to have curlews on their land and like, like very much to, to try and encourage them. So, so um, we need to realise that a lot, if we have curlews, in many cases, it's simply because, the, because of the farming practice and traditions that uh, happen in our land. Uh, right, um, th that's enough from me. Uh, Lizzie, on to you. Tell us about your work uh, on, on the meadows along the River Avon in Hampshire. Yeah, will do. I'll just try and share my screen. Is that working all right, Mike? Great. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for having me today. So um, my name is Lizzie Gration and I work for the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. Um, I've been here for about eight years now, uh, mainly working on a breeding wager project in the Avon Valley. So a little bit about me. I trained as an ecologist and then specialised into ornithology um, and then sort of particularly moved into into wading birds. And then, yeah, started at the GWCT in about 2015 on a wader recovery project. So this was the Life Waders for Real. And I was the project officer for this um, for the whole whole five years. And my role has now changed slightly. So I'm uh, ecologist in our wetlands department. And I'm also sort of part of our advisory team um, where I facilitate um, the Lower Avon Valley Farmer Cluster, um, where our priority species are our breeding waders. So the Avon Valley is a fantastic place. Uh, we're right on the sort of Hampshire, Dorset, Wiltshire border, um, situated in the south of the UK. And it's a very sort of typical river valley system. It's a very long linear system. It's got all the designations you can throw at it. It's got triple SI, Ramsar, SPA. Um, and that designation is for a whole suite of wetland specialists. So it's for important um, you know, meadow plant species. It's also the important aquatic plant species. It's for the breeding waders and a whole other assemblage of um, uh, of birds uh, wintering and, and breeding. And it's got a huge amount of important invertebrate life as well. And again, the river river is is part of a triple SI and that's important for for trout and grayling and salmon. So it's an incredible system and it faces a lot of a lot of pressures. Obviously, it's a it's a linear system, so it's it's surrounded by arable areas, uh, woodland, and urban areas. So lots of different pressures um, impacting the system. So the Avon Valley is, like I said, really important for breeding waders. Um, over the last sort of, uh, thirty years or so, it's it's seen a similar pattern of of wader decline um, within its lapwing, redshank, and snipe numbers. Um, and we, um, GWCT, along with the RSPB, have sort of monitored this decline. And essentially, back in 2015, we kind of said to all the all the farmers, because it's all privately farmed, um, the whole of the valley, we kind of got everybody in a room and said, "Look, this is what's happening. Do you want to do something about it?" And they all turned around and said, "Yes, please." So we kind of started the sort of conservation work back in 2015, and 
we managed to get some life funding, which was which was really, really good. And we wanted to understand you know, what was going wrong in this system. Um, so a big part of the project is really working with the farmers. That's that's the main part of this is that bottom up approach, understanding why they're motivated, why they want to be involved, whether they want to do something about it and how how they're going to go about doing it. So these sort of interviews and questionnaires were really, really important at the start of a project to understand what was motivating people um, and how we could how we could get involved and how we could help. Um, and as Mike um, mentioned earlier, this sort of um, where there's been a lack of funding in some of the Natural England departments, we've lost advisors and we've lost these targeted advisors. So there's a bit of a missing link there. Um, so people are wanting to do stuff, but not always knowing how, um, not always knowing what extra licenses they might need to do it. Um, so we were able to fill that gap. So the way this real approach, we had four main, four main ways of approaching the problem. So we were looking at improving habitat, understanding predator pressure um, and trying to alleviate predator pressure. Um, really quite intensive monitoring so that we can feed back whether things are working or not. And again, working really closely with the farmers to make sure um, that they're involved and we're taking them along and we're understanding their concerns and working with them and providing them with motivation um, to do to do the extra work we're, we're asking them to do. So we did things like creating better nesting habitat, so removing um, some of the fences that were no longer stock proof and opening up these meadows to make them better for, for breeding waders and then improving brood rearing habitat. So creating more wet areas um, for, for birds to take their chicks, for chicks to feed, create really rich invertebrate areas. Um, I've always got to throw this, this photo in. This is a really, this, this to me is a perfect little muddy puddle for, for waders to take their chicks. But obviously this is quite a hard sell to a farmer. It's not very good for grazing. It's not very good for hay. But this is quite an easy sell to a farmer. Um, everybody loves lapwing and to see a big brood of lapwing chicks is quite an easy sell. So we also really quite focused on trying to reduce predation pressure. So we did this through um, non-lethal methods um, such as nest cages. Um, but what worked for us was the temporary electric fencing. So we were fencing quite large areas um to fence a number of a number of lapwing and red shank pairs um aiming to get some nice chick rearing habitat in there as well so they can have their nests in the fence and have that chick habitat available in the fence as well and we also work really closely with with the keepers who are already um are in place on a number of these sites to advocate for best practice lethal um legal predator control mainly for foxes but also for crows and american mink and this worked best where it's alongside the temporary electric fences. One of the things we really started to find through our predator uh, research is that it really needs to be targeted. So um, certain sort of, especially with foxes, they would really target, you know, some of these really important fields. So it needs to be very targeted. It needs to be um, early in the season and it needs to, you know, go on for the whole of the season. I mean, I got this photo, I think I got this photo through about one in the morning from one of our main keepers and he was absolutely gutted um you know we'd only ring this chick a week before um and some of our guys they're so invested now um you know they really put the effort in um this was a bit of a sad occasion but what was really what did what was good that came out of it is two siblings of this brood went on and fledged um but it just sort of highlights you know how how far through the season you need to keep keep going with this it's a lot of work i've just got a little video to show um which is see if it works. Um, and this is sort of really early season. This is a video I got from one of our keepers, really early season of a fox using one of our big main uh, water meadows. So this fox is heading straight through the main main area for our breeding waders. Like I said, this is about early March and it's heading. It knows exactly where it's going. Um, you can see all the little birds dotted around and it's heading for this lovely scrape right in the middle of our our main meadow, um, which is full of full of duck and and lapwing and snipe, um, early season. So it just highlights um, yeah, it just sort of highlights, you know, it does need to be targeted. You need to really focus on on your on your meadows, um on your key meadows because you could have one fox. you know, if this fox wasn't removed, 
early season it's probably going to be out there every night for the rest of your season so if that's where your main breeding waders are um that's where it's going to be keep keep going back to so obviously this site has an active keeper um and then we also put a temporary electric fence right around this pool um to make sure that it's got that that extra protection but they know exactly where they're going um they know the key areas they're very they're very um clever predators And the the increase, the improvement in, in thermal images has been has been outstanding and it's been really, really useful um, and a really, really good tool for predator management um, within the sort of keeper and community. And then we work really closely with the with the farmers to make sure that the, the meadows are managed managed correctly um, and to really encourage people to get them into their best condition going into the following spring. Um, so there's a lot of um, so yeah, a lot of these meadows, you know, they're not they're triple SI, so they're not they're not touched until um, until sort of mid July, where there's likely a hay cut, and then yeah, aftermath grazed. Um, so we don't have any problems with with nest destruction through through agricultural processes here um, because of those you know those those designations. And we, what we have been starting to see is a really nice, nice increase in our breeding waders. So our, our lapwing population has gone from about 60 to up to about 120 now. Um, a nice steady increase, which is really, really nice to see. And nice to see that steady increase um, as well and keeping going for the last couple of years. And we've also seen a similar increase in, in our red shank population. And we're continuing this on now with our farmer cluster approach. So we've got about 14 main main members, but you know this group is much bigger than that. We work with all the keepers, um, all the river keepers, all the grazers, uh, um, the landowners as well. Um, and this group gives an opportunity for a sense of community um, and a sort of areas of areas where people can discuss things and have open conversations without without feeling like things are going to come you know come back to them um and a real yeah sense of community for them to work together and this just gives you a bit of an idea of our what area we're sort of covering so our main connection is all along the river um and our our yellow farm the yellow boundaries are all the farms farms that are involved so we've got a few gaps but we're looking at filling them in um and it just highlights you know how much more we can achieve at that landscape scale um, with all of these guys working together and it gives a bit of real encouragement to some of the smaller farmers um, that what they're doing is being mirrored further down the valley um, and they're going to have more of an impact um, with their with what they're up to and we're now looking at yeah building on what we've been doing with breeding waders with a number of different species and a really nice thing is that all of these things work together really well. There's a lot of the same crossovers in habitat types and specific habitat features that all these uh, different species require. So that all works quite nicely and, and different people have different motivations. So someone might be really keen on water bowls and that's great. They can go and do do some work for water bowls and that's probably going to have a really good knock on um, for a number of the other species as well. And just to highlight that I think this approach really does work the sort of farmer cluster approach when you've got you know people together you create this really nice sense of ownership and you give people a bit more of a confidence um, to give things a go um, and try out try out different things a bit of friendly competition always works quite nicely we call it sort of lapwing envy um, how many pairs have you got this year um, always gives people a bit of a you know ambition to try try a bit harder next year um, and then my role is able to support this. Um, we can bring in different specialists um, and I can provide um, a good connection between the farmers and Natural England Environment Agency and make sure that everything's everyone's got all the right permissions to do to do all the bits they want to do um, and to make sure there's not going to be any sort of negative negative impacts to any of the work for specific species. Um, yeah, so that's me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lizzie. That that's that's really inspiring to hear all the things you've managed to to do. Particularly having a a, a group of advisors who are able to to help the farmers. And uh, maybe we would like to uh, in the discussion come on to this. Just how do you manage to to keep these sort of advisory groups together? It, it needs outside finance and expertise as well. Um, Looking at the questions in the in the chat, I noticed there's 
one specific question um, on uh, curlew site fidelity that we're always banging on about. They are incredibly uh, faithful to their uh, breeding sites and indeed to their wintering sites. We know this through um, uh, colouring birds which come year after year back to the same field. But there is a question to you, Mike, um, saying uh, if they are so site, site faithful, how easy is it to establish uh, new sites? How long does it take? How do you how do you make them uh, move away from their site fidelity uh, approach? Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the habitats that have been restored and have been used for by breeding curlews have generally been in the areas where you've got established territories. So there'll be the established birds moving around, you know, one field to the to the other, or possibly, you know, their offspring coming back to that area. But undoubtedly, when there's a shortage of high quality habitat, because of you know because of all the losses of habitat that we've we've just just sort of outlined, if you can create a, a big area of high quality habitat, you know the birds will find it. There are a number of adults and first year, second year birds that that are travelling around looking for habitats. We know from well, that might get some of your studies in the Seven and Avon, your birds have some of your adults have tracked around the Midlands and, and, and through the Upper Thames. We've also had head started birds nesting or certainly, you know, trying to breed in the Upper Thames from the, that were released at Stimbridge. So I think um, your best chance of success is if you do the do the habitat creation close to where the birds existing breeding populations are. If you're not that close, you've got to make the quality of habitat as great as you can. And if your funds are unlimited, I guess you might be looking at head starting as well. Um, but I think, you know, you know, can you just, a bit like that we've seen with the cranes, you know, how they've colonized new habitats uh, and they tend also tend to come back to the new, new uh, sorry, come back to their traditional sites, but also they are on the lookout for new sites and it's the high quality habitat that they'll, 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 they'll look for um, and where they can be successful. So, um, Along the Thames in the tributaries, we're some some areas we're desperately short of high quality habitat. So by restoring meadows, you know, th it, it, through these farmer clusters, it would could unlock a lot of um, uh, opportunity for curlews to start flourishing in these landscapes. You're muted, Mike. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, uh, Lizzie, uh, Elizabeth, do you want to uh, add anything to what Mike's just said on this question of um, new establishment of, uh, of of new sites for curlews? Lizzie, you go first. Yeah, I mean, well, like that. So I'm not obviously primarily on curlew. So what what we've always what we've done here is very much work on what we've got and then try and move move locally um and and for us it's worked yeah we've really focused on on key sites that are already being used um and that seems to be seems to be what's worked for us um and then we're still very slowly moving to our more northern sites um so it is quite a i mean it's quite a slow slow process and it's 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 tricky as well because you have to gear those sites up for sort of everything i think so we've got some sites here that you know the habitat looks great but we know there's no level of predator management um and a lot of the keepers i speak to like say they're so worried about the initial disturbance early season that if they turn up to a new area um and they've got that level of predator disturbance that might be enough to put them off um and we we might not see that if we're not out there looking for that as well um so i think there's those other parts playing a playing a role. Thanks Lizzie. I, I was very impressed by your statement that you don't have any problems with cutting dates in your your area. I I, I think all the rest of us struggle like mad mm -hmm. to uh, with this problem and I wonder if the 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 three panelists might like to say something something about about what you can do um, to try to uh, make sure that the cutting doesn't interfere with the uh, uh, the, the, 
first the eggs and then then the young chicks. Elizabeth, do you want to say something on that? Um, yeah, the, the, the cutting days generally is a very tricky and complex issue because you're trying to balance a farmer making a productive hay or silage crop with wildlife, and often there are there are odds, and so it. it yeah, and so if, if you want a farmer to do a later cutting date, then we need agri-environment schemes to suitably refund and re reward farmers for doing that management that's meaning they're getting less 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 crop off it. Um, so we've been working with um, DEFRA on a steering group for the new, con um, the new elms um, and to try and work with them on that sort of cutting dates. But there's so much nuance around which sites is good for early, what's late sort of changing cutting dates in response to the what the, the vegetation is looking like. And, and sort of all that we're getting back from DEFRA and the sort of government is that they want to simplify the schemes and make them as sort of as advisor light as possible um, and therefore cheaper to administer. Um, but the problem without having sort of Natural England advisors being able to modify your sort of your higher level stewardship schemes to really tailor it to a site um, and have some flexibility potentially on, on cutting dates. Um, you're just left with a blanket date. Um, and so we'll see what actually comes out in the new uh, version of countryside stewardship um, as to quite where they've gone to with cutting dates. But um, yeah, it, it's it's tricky and I would say often and we, we know from as much data that sort of botanically a later cutting date is generally better um, and there's been a, a lot of work on this particularly in upland hay meadows um, and that sort of but um, but how you go about having an earlier cutting date and preserving the curlew I'm afraid is not my area of expertise so I'll pass on to somebody else to um, talk about that. But before we do uh, ask the others to talk on that, uh, I sometimes hear from botanist friends in in our area uh, that they they don't very late cutting dates cause problems with the botany that you get uh, rough grasses, uh, you know, shielding out the the the, the more delicate uh, hay meadow plants that you want to. Uh, that, that you, you you're as a botanist wanting to conserve. How how do you get around that one? Yes, as I said, there's a lot of nuance in there as to what what cutting date is better on which sort of sites, and and moving to a sort of right right at the end of the year, sort of the summer, can be quite can be deleterious botanically because when you take a hay crop, you're removing nutrients with the hay. But as the sort of the year progresses, the grass goes from sort of green and lush to, to brown because the grass is remobilizing its sort of carbohydrate sugars from the leaf and protein back down into the roots as the, the leaves senesce, they sort of die. And so you take a later cut and you remove less uh, nutrients um, along with the cut. And so you leave more in the soil and we and higher soil fertility is very strongly correlated to lower species richness so the more nutrients you can take off the the you lower the soil fertility and then you're going to get a better more floristically diverse plant community um so there's that interplay of you want to do a reasonably early botanically um to remove nutrients but then if you do it too early you 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 take off all the seed heads and for a lot of the perennial species, this isn't necessarily as much of a problem as it's sometimes thought to be because they're perennial. So they'll keep growing from one year to the next and they only need to re produce seeds and sort of regenerate every few years. And some of the floodplain meadow species can be very long lived. You can have sort of patches of things that have been there for sort of 15, 20 years. Um, and so they can cope with an earlier cut and um, floodplain meadows often might have had a couple of cuts in a year because they're so rich, because you've got the nutrients coming down in the in the water that they could cope with two cuts a year. Um, yeah. Yeah, we we, um, we noticed in the Severn Vale after the 
disastrous summer floods of 2007 when when everything was was killed by the floods the the fastest plants to come back was great burnet because they've got these this root system and they're they're obviously adapted to be able to come back to to yeah. e even to an, a severe summer su uh, flood mm -hmm. like we we had yeah. there and on the the flip side yeah. of that some of the annual species particularly yellow rattle that if you take an early cut on a on a meadow with yellow rattle you just kill it off because it's it's got very short-lived seeds in the seed bank and so it needs to produce seeds every year to be able to uh, recreate the, the population next year so on a sort of a, a meadow with yellow rattle you need to wait until they've sort of brown and started rattling um, and then it's the sort of good for for hay cut at that point but you I, you don't find those so much on a floodplain and and of course fa farmers also want uh, don't want a late hay cut because just as you've described the, a lot of the goodness goes out of the hay if it uh, if it's cut late and they say it's only u any use for bedding and not use for for food so you've got to look at it from the farmer's point point, point of view as well um I'd like to. I'd like us to come back to the notion of uh, government support for these things. But Mike, I don't know if you want to say anything about um, cutting dates uh, for the moment. You're muted, Mike. <laughs> the the later cutting dates are really important in terms of breeding success for curlews. I think <clears throat> um, one area of lowland um, meadows, floodplain meadows, where the curlews do really well also is the lower Derwent Ings. And, and there, I believe, um, almost all of the meadow, almost all of the land there in the floodplain is late cut hay meadow. Um, and they have amongst the sort of highest sort of fledging successes, success rates for curlews, you know, in lowland England. So that's quite a pointer. Uh, we tending to find where we fledge chicks at the moment. It's the sites which have the late hay cuts because it is really quite quite challenging to navigate through June hay cuts for all the reasons outlined. Um, but um, I think it, you know if we're looking at curly recovery, we need some core areas of high quality hay meadow in a probably in a in a matrix of perhaps more intensively or different differently managed grasslands because the, the curlies will take advantage of those but they need some safe places to to nest and to raise the chicks and at the moment it's those that are being squeezed um for example you know they might start nesting in a field and then and then actually instead of a hay a grass cut they could you know livestock could start grazing in there and then that's the end of that breeding attempt um <clears throat> So those, those sorts of things is where by working together with with our volunteer surveyors and with the knowledge gained over the years, working with the farmers, we can try and minimise those um, those unfavourable sort of events uh, and maximise the oppor opportunity to fledge chicks. But it's, it is really hard to fledge the chicks, as we know from all the studies, you know, places like Shropshire, Herefordshire, your studies, Mike, as well, showing that we're not fledging enough chicks. Um, but we're, there's going to be more research into that as well with the next stage of the Curly Recovery Partnership. So we're going to be learning more. Um, but I think <clears throat> looking from a Curly's perspective, we're looking at, at hay meadows that can fledge chicks and it's the late cut ones that are really going to, going to pay dividends. So that's where the where the public money needs to go, most importantly, I think. Mike, thank, thanks for raising the question of productivity. I was just about to, to go on to that because I, as I'm sure all the participants will know one of the reasons for the the crashing curlew numbers right across Europe uh, in the last 25 years is exceeding poor productive productivity of chicks. Thing is curlews can live up to 30 years so uh, one adult doesn't need really to produce chicks every year but it it ought to produce them every other year say. They're, they're long-lived birds they can live for 30 years but if for year upon year upon year they don't produce any chicks at all, then that's that's one of the basic reasons for the the the, the decrease here. And I, I wonder, um, Lizzie, would you like to comment on wh whether you how you see your lapwing and red shank populations doing? If if the numbers of pairs that try to inc uh, try to breed are increasing, are you also getting increasing productivity? Yeah. So we've done a lot of 
very detailed productivity monitoring. I haven't um, yeah, put the information in here, but we, we know that our productivity on, on average is now pretty good. So out of our, for the five years where we had our, our life project, we know that three of those years we were above, quite a bit above the 0.7 threshold, uh, which is sort of chicks prepare for lapwing, which is what we need to maintain a stable population. Um, and through some of our colour ringing work as well, we know that we're getting birds back back to breed. So we are, we're not just creating a sink of nice habitat, we're actually producing enough chicks there. Um, and one of the things we really, really see is that it's the first nesting attempts that do well. Um, if you can get your first round of nests hatching um, on some of our areas, we've got really quite high nesting success now, um, which is again helped by that increase in pair numbers because you know they're more of a colony species so for us that works really well um, but it's very clear that the first round of nests do a lot better in the long term so if you can get that first round of nests hatching those chicks have so much better chance of getting off um, in our system yeah again the meadows grow up so so quickly and actually by the time we get to this time of the year they're almost too hard for some of the some of the chicks to navigate through um so anything that's still sort of nesting now is a bit a bit too late in the season for us so we really concentrate on getting that first round of nesters nesting off that seems to make the biggest difference and i think also now you've got every, all the other predators have got their own babies to feed um so there's a lot more predators around around now um so small chicks just are absolutely hammered by everything um at this time of the year Yeah, um, I, I, I think um, I'd also like to go back to the point that Elizabeth raised of, of the question of support for government support for farmers. I mean, it, it seems to me that uh, the only hope for lots of meadow nesting birds is to have some, some sort of much stricter arrangement or more generous arrangement for uh, to, to compensate farmers who who look look after their their meadow nesting curlews and indeed any other meadow nesting species. And uh, in the Netherlands last week, uh, we saw that uh, while there are huge agricultural subsidies to encourage farm production, there's also fairly generous um, uh, provision for conservation measures for curlews. We were told that in, in one province anyway, um, uh, every time they put a, a, a farmer allowed a nest fence to go up on his land, he got, he got 100 euros. Uh, it would be quite nice if some, some sort of similar ar arrangement could be made here. Um, and I think Curlew Action are, are, are very interested in that sort of possibility uh, and of trying to persuade the government to to do this with the new elms things um mike i don't know whether you'd like to develop that idea further yeah yeah i mean we <coughs> there was a previous webinar that looked at the cost of a curlew didn't wasn't it? there are there are a variety of sources of funding so you think you've got to think what's really going to work in your land in your landscape um in terms of, you know, I've mentioned a couple of the big NGOs have, have basically established large nature reserves as well. That's that's helped. Um, so there's different sources of investment. Those nature reserves are still funded through the ag agri environment schemes, as are the as are the the private farmland sites. Um, but the, there's potentially a sort of funding mix. There's other there's other funding sources potentially. Um, but yeah, we it undoubtedly will require a lot of investment of the of the new agri-environment scheme funds if we're going to see curly turn around and it makes sense to go for those win-wins in these meadows that can deliver all these variety of benefits um that's that's just all, all sort of seems to stack up but yeah it needs to be very targeted so for curly recovery we really need to go where the birds are at the moment and with a joined up local plan that's based on you know knowledge of the sites because you know we've got quite a few contributions in the chat very different landscapes very different farming systems so it needs to be very bespoke um, but yeah rewarding farmers for, for um, successful nesting um, successful fledging would be would be great not just financial but you know that recognition i think lizzie mentioned is really important that 
doing things really well and backed up by the science, knowing that they're creating the right habitat, you know, for these birds. I think it's really important. And you've had a, a, a great results largely through sort of marshalling your teams of volunteers because you can't expect farmers who are busy with lots of other things uh, to, to spend hours just finding where the, the nests are and then looking after the chicks. They just don't have, have the time and probably not not the expertise or, the, or, or even the will to, to, to do this. So it, it, some kind of monitoring system is, is terribly important. And that, that's all very well if you, you know, if, if people volunteer for it, but it, it, in most places it will need a little bit of encouragement to pay for their, their petrol costs or something, or, or, or just to get them together and to train them a little bit. I know you've had a lot of, you've done a lot of work on that. Perhaps you'd like to expand a bit on that? Uh, yeah, yeah, very much so. It's very much a sort of collaboration, isn't it, between between our volunteers, the far farmers, and the farmers are often very, you know, very knowledgeable on the curlews as well. So I think it's, um, in my mind, the, uh, we're going on this sort of journey together. So the farmers, volunteers, the conservation sort of advisors, if you like, and everybody else involved, we all need to really um, understand the curlew ecology as, as much as we can. Um, but also learning from experience. So each year we're learning more. So curlews like particular fields. You can target agri-environment funds to the fields that curlews like to nest in. Often the larger fields, as I mentioned, relatively flat. You know, they may have some um, uh, su surviving floral interest that can be in in developed. So it it's that sort of bigger plan. And, and several farmers working together, you can get a sense of a bit of competition, but also working together. If it's, you know, for example, I think um, Lizzie mentioned the predator control. That's something that we really need to Im improve because we've got some probably some good habitat areas, but the predator numbers are too too high. That's impacting. Um, so yeah, there's, there's opportunities like that. Um, and obviously volunteers get a huge amount out of it uh, in terms of you know being, in, being involved in conservation projects and be able to sort of really make a difference. Um, it's quite skilled work as well. So you do you do learn a lot, and it's 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 great sort of learning the field work skills, finding the nests and and so on. Um, but I think I'd also say it also is very very um, uh, challenging as well, particularly this time of year. I think folk working in the silage silage dominated areas is really challenging. You know, seeing all the operations going in and the ch the stress with the chicks. So we have some of that as well. So I think um, you know it's. It's it's challenging work as well as enjoyable at times. But if we can get that's where I think you know, the more we can get these these improved habitats, the more meadow habitats where the curlews can flourish in, in combination with the with the predator management and the right funding in place. Which you know we know that the agri environment schemes have worked well in places like the Upper Thames. Okay, uh, breeding wading numbers have gone down still away from the the nature reserve areas so we haven't stemmed the decline say in lapwing but it has held the line if you like for curlews and with further investment in along those lines I'm, you know i'm sure curlews at least can be can continue to be sort of turned around in us if we do it joined up way um but yeah it's, it's a significant amount of money that needs to be directed through the schemes in into these key areas yeah you, I think you just hit on the key point there. Uh, in the future, are we going to resign ourselves to having these meadow birds, curlews, and other breeding waders nesting only in reserves, or are we going? Can we manage to maintain them on farmed land uh, as they always have done in the past? And that gets to become a really almost a basic philo philosophical question. Uh, are we are we just looking for res reserves, which, as Lizzie said, might just turn up into uh, to be sinks, or are we looking for um, to have things spread right across the country? And I I think that's where the, um, the question of government funding comes from. I don't see how we can maintain it across the whole countryside without government uh, input. And uh, Elizabeth, you touched on that I don't know if you want to come in and expand a bit on what ha, what we can do to uh, to press DEFRA to to be more inclined to to uh, provide the necessary financial support 
Well, DEFRA are quite constrained by the WTO trade rules. Um, we don't have a free hand now we're out, outside of the EU. We are we're, we're constrained to only be able to pay income foregone and costs incurred. Um, so we're sort of stuck with that that metric and how they then calculate how much they can pay farmers. Um, so the the Lizzie, get, get, Elizabeth, get, go into that a bit more. I'm I'm horrified to hear that 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 that, that the, these WTO rules are so important. I've heard 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 that bef before, but expand on that a bit for us. Um, yes, the, the, there are, there are these the the rules that say you can't sort of effectively subsidize. You can you can only subsidise your 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 farmers by if they've if done something like uh, cut a later hay cut, um, whereas they could have taken multiple silage cuts and got a lot more crop off. You you calculate how much they would have they've lost by doing a later cut, um, and then how much it's cost them to do that cut, and then that then forms the, the the basis of the amount of money that they get for that kind of action. So there, um, there are economists in DEFRA and they have um, consultants that sort of go through all of these and work out sort of average amounts across the country for how much it costs to do each individual like countryside stewardship option. Um, and then these figures are then they're used to then set the payment rates. Um, so we... <laughs> The, the, it's 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 tricky, and DEFRA and government are are keen to diversify the amount of funding that comes in and try and get the private sector to sort of step fill the breach. So you're seeing that come through with BNGs, that's biodiversity net gain, which is coming into law later into this rule. So new development sites will have to be sort of show a, a 10% gain in biodiversity, either on site or off site. So that will bring in uh, private sector funding into the, the farming scenario. Um, uh, but then I think also we as consumers have quite a large part to play because farmers are constrained by the economics, which is how much they can sell their produce for. And food prices now compared to sort of average incomes are as low as they've ever been. Um, and so if if we want to see uh, a landscape filled with low intensity agriculture and meadows and flowers, then um, we're going to need to change our diets. Um, and pay a bit more for for meat. Um, and we also look at changing farming practices, as somebody in the chat was saying earlier about regenerative farming um, practices, but also looking at where we grow things um, and sort of more moving to mixed farming. And it, it plays into a, a much bigger debate. But as well as all these economics that are farmers um, sort of contemplating when they're how they manage their farm, I think something that we, we really need to, that Lizzie mentioned earlier about Farmers have they have interests. Some farmers interested in some things and some aren't. Um, and and the sort of the economics set the the sort of the wider context about what they can and can't do on their farm. But then within that, they're driven by their innate motivations. And for many farmers, that's to have beautifully green, uniform grass, um, no weeds, and just sort of very efficient or the perceived efficient farming practices and to look very neat. Um, and we need to change that mentality um, and help farmers to sort of appreciate what they could have on their land. And I think that's where some the volunteers can come in to, to sort of ex demonstrate to farmers the real benefits that can be had by changing the farming practices and really make them proud of what they can have on their land and what they can um, what they can do. Uh, th thank you for that. Um... I'm still horrified by the WTO references, but it, it makes me think of the number of times I've spoken to farmers who've said, oh, my neighbour has got a grant for taking his hedges out and now got another one for putting them back in. And, and or for, you get one, one grant for draining a field and another grant for wetting it again. And there doesn't seem to be any mechanism anywhere to reward farmers who just do things naturally. They, it, it, it's always got to be correcting something that went wrong before. If they did it right all the way along, they just stay poor and don't do, and, and don't get yeah. any benefit at all. Yeah, and we make this case very strongly to DEFRA that you need yeah. the 
high payments for maintenance of species rich sites and the problem with bng is that's going to reward people who've done poor management previously because you've got to improve the status whereas if you've been doing the right thing for many years you can't access the bng money which is a bit of a problem yeah yeah we, we, uh, let, let me quote something that came up today we we had a pair of curlews nesting in a horrible silage field which had been uh, ploughed up, re uh, replanted, reseeded with, um, uh, with, with ryegrass. All, uh, all, all it had in it was ryegrass and far, you, you wouldn't believe the size of the docks in it, uh, be, which had been caused by, the, uh, by, by turning over the earth. And the curlews, for some reason, nested in that. And the farmer came up to us. He's very helpful and supportive and said, I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut that. Um, what, uh, what are you going to do, chaps? And we'd already, he'd already allowed us to put a, an electric fence to protect the eggs. They hatched a couple of days ago. And then, bless their hearts, the parents took them into the neighbouring field, which is a lovely ancient hay meadow. So he cut, gets to cut his silage and the birds have moved into the neighbouring um, uh, the neighbouring hay meadow where presumably um, there's better insect life. And I wonder if we ought to move on to, on to that importance of, uh, we've talked about the birds, we've talked about the botany, we ought to talk about the insect life and so uh, food for curlews uh, in hay meadows. Do you find, Lizzie, that, um, that, that, that you've got better um, insect food for, uh, and, and Elizabeth already showed it in her presentation that old hay meadows have better uh, insect presentation um, population. But is do you find that that helps with your lapwings and wedge hanks? Definitely, yeah. You can you can see in the more sort of you know the the unimproved, <laughs> as you say, the you know the floristically diverse meadows have definitely have a better food source. Um, we've done some sort of direct comparisons of of lapwing chicks on arable versus in the water meadows and yeah they're so much bigger and healthier in the water meadow systems and they'll fledge you know they can fledge early um we can you know we can get lapwing chicks um flighting yeah sort of 30 days and i've caught lapwing chicks on arable fields at 40 45 days so you know there's the food source is very good um and it's getting getting chicks off off nice and early um, which is really, really useful. Um, and again, all the sort of wet features that we're adding in are just, you know, they're, they're brilliant for, for creating areas for invertebrates and little wet um, sort of yeah, muddy areas that are, you know, absolutely full of invertebrate life, which is, and again, if you've got that invertebrate life there, it's less distance for birds to have to travel to find food, which is then makes them less, less vulnerable um, to predation as well. Is it possible that one of the reasons for the poor pro productivity is simply starvation? There just isn't enough food for them and they do starve. We have seen that, that on we've seen that on arable nesting lapwing, um, chicks chick with radio tracking, just finding chicks that have just just keeled over. Um that's easily starvation or dehydration um in areas where there's just not enough, not enough food. Um but yeah, I've never never seen that in the in the valley system. <laughs> they either Either fledge or get get munched by something. <laughs> Mike, do you want to expand on that? Uh, yeah, no, my thoughts are more in terms of um, where we get the highest densities of curlews um, are the are, are basically well, we're pretty much at Otmore at the moment, where we say we've got the twenty odd pairs, and <clears throat> some of those fields you get a pair on on every field. Some fields, the bigger ones, you can get two pairs, even three pairs. And um, so you've got the, you know, we know what thought, what really good habitat can look like and how the curlews can bef can perform. You know, you've got several pairs per hundred hectares in that habitat, whereas in more farmed landscapes, generally we're getting about a pair uh, uh, every, um, I'd say, hundred hectares, something like that. You know, because the the we use and you see it when the chicks hatch, they uh, in a, probably in a more intensively farmed landscape, the chicks are being moved quite a lot further. I mean, uh, the scientists would have to have to sort of back this up, really. But this is what my own observations. Um, 
Uh, and also in terms of the habitat features that you've got, you know, if, you, if you've got more topography, you've got scrapes a lot more, you've got the botanically rich sites. So it's the same along the Thames as well with these ancient hay meadows. That's where you get the highest densities because there's there's a high abundance of food um, and birds can raise their chicks in quite a sm relatively small area. So they're not putting the, put, it, uh, put as much risk, they're not having to you know, take them uh, uh, miles across different fields to find the best areas. So I think there's an element of that as well. Um, but I've never seen curly chicks struggling for food. They even in the improved, sorry, in the <laughs> the rye grass grasslands, they do seem to, you know, and and they do seem to be feeding well and growing well. Um, and um, you know, potentially they are productive grasslands. You can keep the predator numbers down, and you can navigate through through the various sort of cutting phases um, as we you know, we are seeing in places like the Yorkshire Dales, I believe some some good productivity. So um, yeah, but but you know we we don't have big areas of farmland with curlew. So we, we I think our key for us will be having the best quality investment of from those schemes, getting the best quality habitats or having the highest density in in those habitats that we that we can. Um, it's going to work for us, I think. Um, we've got about another 10 minutes left. Could I suggest that for, we just ha have uh, ask each of the panelists to give their comments on on two thoughts? W one would be, um, do we know enough about the insects? Is is this something where we ought really to be doing more research? Uh, what you're from what you're saying, you're all assuming that they're terribly important, but uh, is there enough evidence really to be able to support the contention that um, that, that hay meadows really do produce uh, better food and better insect? So one, do we need more on on insects? And two. Um, following your your really frightening comments, uh, Elizabeth, about the the need for private fund funding, should bodies like Curlew Action be looking for large sums of money to to try and uh, stand in if the government isn't going to do its duties? Lizzie, why don't you start off on those insects and pr private money? Um. <laughs> Probably, there's probably, uh, is, I mean, there's always areas where re more research is going to be useful. Um, and it's always going to be, you know, that's going to be going on for a while. I think with with Curlew, there's definitely a need to obviously act now um, and and research as we go. Um, I think I think based on on where we see, you know, what where the birds are choosing to nest and where they are doing well, I think we can we can say those areas are gonna be gonna be good for invertebrates. I think the general knowledge there is probably good enough for that. But I think understanding where chicks are foraging and how how whether they're being successful is is really, really important. It's it's hard work, um, but it is really, really important. And again, to make to give the farmers that um, motivation it's so so useful to be able to say that your your chicks have fledged um so being able to re relate that to the invertebrate abundance is going to be very useful um and then yeah as i guess i guess going on to the sort of funding thing um i think your comment earlier mike sort of are we going to be able to do things like this in a farmed environment i think we definitely can in some places but not not everywhere so there's going to be some areas where you know like my sites work because they're farmed because some of them have got small scale shoots on them and therefore they they have a they have keepers and that's one of the reasons why they do well so if if they weren't on those if those sites weren't weren't run as as a as an estate with a shoot um there wouldn't be that there wouldn't be those keepers there and and then that wouldn't work so actually for my sites being farmed works for them and then hopefully that private funding on top will help um but like elizabeth said we're very very worried about the payments not paying for existing work um where people have already been doing things so that's something yeah we're we're fighting fighting for and trying to understand how that's all going to work um and I think in our system, the government funding has worked in places. You know, a lot of all of my all of my good meadows are in the higher level stewardship with those breeding wader um, options, and they are working. They just need little bits topped up. 
um, and that has actually worked quite well. Um, and I think the private funding could be could be really good on top of that, but it just does need to be done done right. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. <laughs> Oh, that's very helpful. Mike, your turn. In, insects and private money. Yeah, the, the in, insects first. Yeah, I would. it would be great to have some more detailed research on chick, um, well, uh, yeah, on, on curlew diet, particularly the chicks. I do remember years and years ago, I worked on stone curlews and I, I, I was very aware of the amazing research that Reese Green had done on curlews showing how the diet changed almost every week <laughs> as different invertebrate food resources became available for the stone curlews from you know from earthworms to wood lice to one week to ground beetles the next it would be fascinating to know you know what our curlews in meadows are eating each week because it's probably going to vary with these different peaks and troughs of abundance so that that would be fantastic to do um, in terms of the private money um, and so on. Yeah, there's a lot of people investing private money out of goodwill and, and so on in curlews as it is. A lot of our farmers, of course, and the and the conservation charities. Um, the Wildlife Trust, for example, uh, are starting to receive funds for their uh, grass management from uh, from biodiversity uh, biodiversity offset scheme. So I think in terms of habitat banks for curlews, that would be the way to do it creating habitat banks in the key curlew areas where money from those schemes will be invested where we know we'll, they'll, they'll be most successful as we've talked about before you know create some great hay meadows with the right conditions for all, all the wildlife to thrive and um, do but do that in, in bigger blocks you know as habitat banks thanks mike elizabeth your your turn to finalize on on insects and money um i think the floodplain uh, meadows partnership they've been doing some work on insects and in, in meadows um because often there's the sort of the fear that oh it's going to be cut and you therefore you're going to kill off all of the insects when you when you take a hay cut but actually quite a few things survive because they sort of say they've they've gone down into the soil it depends at which stage of their life cycle and that they can cope with a cut later on in the year but not earlier um but yeah always more data is good both for how you sort of influencing management practices because the more we know about what different species need you can tweak the management according to to the different species um and also just making the case for uh more species rich grasslands um, as to why they're so valuable, that it's it's not just the plants, it's the insects, it's the birds, it's the bats, it's everything else that that relies on it. Um, yeah, and as somebody pointed out in the the, the chat as well about um, the some of the um, veterinary medicines that are given, the sort of wormers um, that are given to livestock are often very bad. Um, the things like dung beetles. So um, yeah, we need to consider all of the thing. Um, and. Private money, yes, that's the the way things are, are moving. Um, so it, it's a case of trying to direct what's available into the best, <clears throat> delivering the best possible stuff. Um, and I think that the, the Lawton principles of bigger, better, and more joined up are always a good sort of one and a good proxy. Even if we don't know what some particular insect needs, you provide it with a diversity of habitats and good quality habitat and you'll hopefully be benefiting lots of different different wildlife right thank you very much elizabeth and um on behalf of all the participants can i thank our three panelists for their very interesting and and knowledgeable uh input it's 1959 so i'll leave one minute to to ellen to finalize uh any uh, last thing she wants to say uh, on behalf of Code of Action. Thank you very much to the panellists and thank you to all the participants. We hope you found it interesting. And it has been recorded, so it will uh, at some future stage be available for you to look, look and listen at again on the Curlew Action website. Thank you and good night. Ellen, yours. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, just one very, very quick thing from me. Uh, thank you everyone for coming along. Obviously these webinars that we do are uh, put on for free, but if you do feel that you could donate, Curly Action would really, really appreciate it and it will help us to continue to put on events like this. And I will be emailing around a recording link to everyone tomorrow morning probably. So thank you very much for coming and good night.